Tomorrow. Time to welcome back space flight expert Tim Furness. Tim, Morning, sir. Happy lovely birthday to see you. To oh, thank you very nice much. Flight. I was about to say a happy belated new year to you. Thank you. Now, there's lots going hmm. on, isn't there, in the space diary for 1986? Indeed, indeed. It's going to be a very, very busy year, very, very exciting one. Well, tomorrow the space shuttle's going up again. It's its 25th mission. And this time it's going to carry the first citizen in space, who's a lady, a US teacher called Sharon Krista McAuliffe, the first citizen in space. Does so she have to have had any special training well, when you she said would, that she's the first citizen? That's she right. She would have had about 100, 100 hours training just to learn about the shuttle, how to operate the toilet, switch on the lights, make the food. That's yes. all. I mean, she's not going to be trained to fly anything because she's essentials. literally a, a passenger. But it's an interesting demonstration of how routine space is becoming, that people can just hop on board and fly. That's much more so exciting for you. That's, and I oh, know. indeed, indeed. So in March, the uh, Halley's Comet comes into the fore again when uh, five international spacecraft zero in on the comet to take close-up pictures. One is Giotto, which was due to fly to within about 500 kilometres of the nucleus of the comet. But unfortunately, yesterday, contact was lost with Giotto. Um, and we're not too sure whether we'll be able to get contact back again. I'm going to make a few phone calls this morning, so when I come back about 11 o'clock, I'll have some more news about so that. We'll have some hot off but that would be very, very sad if that happened, it. because it would have been Europe's first deep space probe, and that's very, very sad. Right, so March, we're going to April. April the 12th, 1986, is the 25th anniversary of the first manned spaceflight by Yuri Gagarin. Now, we can expect, certainly, the Russians to celebrate that event with some sort of space spectacular. Uh, perhaps a uh, flight by three women altogether in a spacecraft. That is, that's uh, something that's been mooted. It's quite a possibility. Mm. So then we go into uh, May. There are going to be two space shuttle flights during May. Uh, one is going to send the G Galileo spacecraft to Jupiter, and the other, the Ulysses spacecraft, which is going to go to Jupiter, be diverted around a polar orbit around the Sun. Now, those are going to be quite exciting missions because, uh, OK, you have to wait a while for the actual mission to be completed, but it'll mean two space shuttles will be going up within five days of each other. So if anybody is near the Cape and uh, having a holiday that time, they'll be able to see two space shuttle flights. In June, a space shuttle's going up again, on the 24th of June, this time with the first Britain in space. At last, we have a man in space. It's taken such That's a long right. time. <laughs> Squadron leader Nigel Wood will be going up to help the deployment of a military communication satellite called Skynet. But we should remember that he will, in fact, be about the 25th passenger on the shuttle, and it will make Britain the 19th nation to have a man in space. So that's not a, a fantastic record, but at least time, we have got it? someone in space at last. Mm. So we go from June to uh, October, and then there's the Space Telescope will be uh, launched by the Space Shuttle, and this will allow people to see about seven times deeper into the universe. We'll be able to see 14 billion be light years. I, I can't sort it will of be, imagine it will how be it's deployed going to be uh, from the shuttle into Earth orbit, and it will be automatically pointed towards various targets. And uh, we will be able to see about 14 billion light years distant into, into space, thanks to the Space Telescope. And then we come into December, and the Galileo spacecraft that I was talking about, on its way to Jupiter, it will pass an asteroid, I've got to be careful how to pronounce this now, Amphritite, in December. And it's quite possible it will take the first close-up pictures of an asteroid. So it's going to be a very, very exciting year. And of course, yesterday was the famous day when Voyager 2 came to Uranus, the eighth planet in the solar system. And uh, the seventh, sorry. And that was really a tremendous uh, event. And the closest approach now was about got, by 60,000 miles. There's a bit of film coming up of that. Yes, that's the launch of Voyager 2 in 1977. In fact, it was the first Voyager to be launched. There were two Voyagers. There was Voyager 1, you can see its flight path at the bottom. Voyager 2, that's we're following its flight path now, going past uh, Jupiter. Now it's arrived at Saturn. These are computer graphics that show what it did as it went past the ring system. And in a moment, we'll see some very spectacular close-up pictures of the rings that it took. And it completely changed uh, our concept of the rings, showing there to be a, about a thousand ringlets made up of snow. This, to me, this is the most exciting thing. I mean, you've given us a fabulous rundown. Well done with your your roundup of what's happening right. in 1986. But what seems to me that in in the end of last year, in the beginning of this year, layers of um, cloud are just being peeled back quite literally, and scientists, astronomers space flight experts like yourself suddenly having to reevaluate all sorts of mm. ideas preconceptions they had or things based on previous knowledge mm. um, and Voyager 2 really has been the most successful at doing that indeed so it's far. fantastic I mean its closest approach lasted about six hours past Uranus system and in those six hours we learnt more about Uranus than we have in the last 200 years since it was discovered I mean that's a fantastic testimony to how far we've gone in space technology in two hours. And I think the saddest thing is the lack of publicity in the papers this morning about the, the event. I mean, there's nothing in the uh, Daily Mail that when I read this morning, there was something in the Telegraph. But I think it's rather a sad reflection on how matter-of-factly we, re we regard it all now.
Yes, we're, we're not we're not even thinking globally, let alone universally. That's right. Universally. Now we've got the fabulous this model the of Voyager craft. here, it's made by Matt Irvin, who's a visitor to Superstore from time to time. Oh. Now he's he's made this model. How are the experiments carried out, Tim? Well, the experiments are mounted on this boom here and this boom, and there are one or two experiments on the main body of the spacecraft itself. Just to give you an idea of its size, that high gain antenna is about 12 foot in diameter, and that boom about sort of 30 foot or so. Um, it weighs about the equivalent of about 900 bags of sugar, just to give you an idea of, of how heavy it is. But the most important part of the whole spacecraft, in my mind, are these three radioisotope thermonuclear generators. Uh, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> right, because what, what you see on most spacecraft are solar panels, which convert the sun's energy into electricity. And of course, Voyager is going away from the sun, much, much further away. So, that so it can't be solar at, at Uranus, That's right, at Uranus, the uh, sunlight is about one four hundredth that it is on the Earth. So these provide the electricity by um, converting the energy of decaying plutonium-434, or something like that, but into electricity. But how long will that last for? Well, oh dear. Oh dear. This is that oh having a collie oh wobbles. Oh, oh, Matt. Sorry, Matt. Matt, are you we'll somewhere some nearby? I'm going I'm to hang right. on. Well, they minute. think actually contact will be lost yeah. with uh, Voyager in about the year 2015, when it's right out of the solar system, when the power from these generators will have uh, been reduced so that it, the, they can't, the signal won't be able to be picked up from the Earth. But uh, these generators at the moment generate about the equivalent of four or five light bulbs at home, about 400 uh, watts of electricity. Now, the signals that are sent from the antenna towards the Earth take two hours, 44 minutes and 55 seconds to so get to the Earth. So when those photographs came back when last get, night... When the signal gets to the Earth, it's got the power of about a torch battery, a run-down torch battery. So a, a phased array of um, tracking antennas are used to sort of amplify the signals, uh, manipulate them electronically, and... Uh, send back the, the pictures that we, we saw yesterday. Now, some people have said they've been a bit, uh, a little mm. bit disappointed by the pictures well, that, that, that came back yes, from they, Uranus. Mm, they are a little bit disappointed, but just wait for another week when the computer-enhanced pictures show up. Now, th this is a diagram of uh, the Uranus system, and there's Voyager going towards Uranus. The most interesting thing is Uranus is on its side, so it's like going towards a long-playing gramophone record sitting vertically. Therefore, as it went through at 45,000 miles per hour, it only had about six hours to do all the photographs. Here's some photographs of um, Ariel. This is a computer graphics, it's not the actual pictures. And there's Miranda. That's a Voyager made the closest approach to any moon on the Voyager mission at Miranda and took some photographs. In fact, there's a very, very interesting crater formation on, that, uh, on the photographs that have been received. And here it is, departing from the system en route to Neptune, which it will reach on August the 25th, 1989. And it, the reason it's getting to Neptune so quickly is because it's using Uran Uranus's uh, gravitational field to divert it on a path to Uranus, just in the same way that it was diverted by Saturn to get to Uranus so quickly. It's it would have taken 30 years for a Voyager to get to, the, uh, get to Uranus directly from the Earth had it not been using the gravitational force of the planets that it passed. How extraordinary. It really is fascinating. There's so much to talk about, Tim. Indeed there but is, But I know yes. that we have, I think we have Heather Cooper, because right, it's not only of interest to scientists and uh, space flight experts, but of course, this is uh, peeling back the layers of knowledge for astronomers as well. And I was uh, watching the news yesterday, and Heather had quite a lot Indeed to say did, yes. about the picture. So hopefully she'll be on mm. the end of the line now. Heather? Sarah, hi. Hello. Pick up your phone, Tim, because okay. uh, you should be able to speak Hello, to, Heather. to Heather as well. I Good morning, know. Heather. I wouldn't trust you with Voyager 2, Sarah. <laughs> no, no, I put it back on its pedestal now. I'm delighted. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly flimsy, I'd say. <laughs> now, what do, what do you make of the, of the pictures that have come back so far? Well, look, I'd like to uh, repeat exactly what Tim said. They might at first stage look very, very disappointing. But what I would like to look at is that these two pictures here, the one on the left shows Uranus not actually enhanced, and the one on the right shows Uranus when they've actually put the full power of computer graphics onto it, and you can really see what it reveals. And in fact, what you're looking at there, you're looking bang onto Uranus's south pole, and what you can see in the middle of your screen is a kind of orangish fog, and that's just like the kind of Los Angeles or old-fashioned smog used to get over London. That's where the south pole of Uranus actually is, and it really shows what you can do after processing. This is an unprocessed picture we got through last night, which shows the whole planet and, uh, as you can see, all the kind of technology around the side. When that's processed in the next few days, I really hope um, the, pic the newspaper will pick that up and use that as one of the best pictures of, of the mission. It's a kind of big gas globe, which is surrounded by rings. And in this picture here, you can just see the edge of one of the rings on the left-hand side of your screen. There are nine rings going around the planet. I think if you've got good eyesight, you can see more. Hey, great, there we are. There they are. Very narrow, aren't they? 
Yes, they're hardly visible. There's some very, very faint ones there. That's right. And originally, they, they weren't thought to be so many, were there? No. In fact, from Earth, you can hardly see them at all. But uh, there they definitely are. The outermost ring there, Sarah, is actually kept, as it were, in shape by two little moons that straddle it either side, like a pair of sheepdogs nosing a lot of sheep into formation. And they've just been discovered, in fact, in the latest round. The, um, the, the nine moons which have just been picked up, two of them are these shepherd moons. And I would guess, actually, with processing, you're going to find more moons in the next few days. I think Tim will probably agree with that. Well, Heather, we'll be watching very, very closely. Thank you so much for giving us uh, your viewpoint this morning. And we look forward to speaking to you very soon. Great stuff. Good luck. OK, Cheer thanks Heather, a lot, bye. Heather. Okay, bye, Tim. Bye, Sarah. Bye, bye, bye. bye, -bye. There are. Marvellous to talk to Heather Cooper. Great, indeed. Tim, we'll be coming back to this later on. Right, and I should have some more news about Giotto oh, just marvellous. after 11 o'clock. And we'll be taking your calls too on yeah. 01 if you're outside London, 811 8055. I'd like to stress that the calls are really about space flight, Voyager 2, whatever you like, not about astronomy because Tim is our space flight expert. Right. So we'll look mm -hmm. forward to that a bit later on this morning. And now it's time for something else very exciting. Well, they must have left the phone off the hook because I've had so many people <laughs> phoning. But uh, just to make an educated guess, uh, what's, uh, the, the spacecraft is three-axis stabilised, so it's pointing its antenna toward, towards the Earth all the time. And it looks like one of the um, axis systems has gone up wrong, so, so the, the spacecraft the is, is wobbling a bit, so its, its antenna is not pointing all the time at the Earth. But all is not lost, because provided that the antenna sweeps the Earth at some point, it might be possible to suddenly lock onto it as it's sweeping the Earth and somehow rectify the problem. So all is not left, lost, but it's a, it is a rather tragic irony that that should occur to uh, Europe's spacecraft moment. on the, the day that uh, Voyager 2 went past Uranus yes. after eight years operation, whereas yes. Giotto was launched only about seven months ago. It could be there's someone in control up there, you know. You never know. You never there know. There might be someone inside the comet. There could be. It's a thought. What about some phone calls? Right. I know mm. we've got some calls lined up for you, Tim. Mm. Who have we got first? Angie. Yes, hello. Good morning. Hello. Hello, morning to you. Hello. What's your question, Anjan? What will happen to Voyager after it has crossed the Uranus, Neptune and Pluto? Right, well, it's going to go past uh, Neptune in 1989, and then it will swing out of the solar system to join Pioneers 10 and 11, and Voyager 1, which will also be leaving the solar system. And it's going to go on and on and on through space towards the bright star Sirius, which it will reach in thousands of years' time. But what is interesting about Voyager is it's got a plaque on its side and also got a, a, a record, a sort of a long playing record attached to it, which had re recorded all the sounds of the Earth. Human voices, bird song, winds, the rain, the sweeping of the waves. You can see a picture waves. of it there, Andrew, and we've got a picture. There it is. Now, provided the, if, if it is, uh, the spacecraft is, comes across some alien civilization in thousands of years' time, and they see this record, provided they've got a gramophone and a needle, they can play it, and uh, they, they might be able to learn a lot, a lot about the Earth and such. But obviously, it's a very remote possibility, but it's a very exciting one as well. That's quite a sort of romantic thought, isn't it? I mean, it's very, very, very exciting to think that somebody somewhere might, mm. might find that. Well, there's, there's no reason to suppose there aren't any other civilizations. No, no. Thank you, Anjum. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice to talk to you. I think we've got Simon next. Hello. Simon on line one. Hello, Simon. What's your question for uh, Tim? Hello, do Simon. You, do you think that humans could live on Uranus? Oh, I don't think so. It's very, very cold. Um, I don't know the exact temperature. You have to ask Heather Cooper that. But I think it's something like minus 300 degrees centigrade. I mean, it's so cold that gases are liquid, liquefied underneath those clouds of Uranus. There's liquid methane, ammonia, ice. Uh, so it's very, very unlikely I that there's going to be anybody living there. Living actually, there. Simon. Um, no, highly personally. unlikely. <laughs> Remember, there's, no, there's hardly any sunlight there. I mean, the sun is about one, one four hundredth fainter um, at Uranus as it is on the Earth. So it's, it's highly unlikely. But what is more likely is that perhaps that uh, men will go and land on, say, Mars or one of the nearer planets, or maybe one of the asteroids, or even a, a moon going around Mars called Phobos, which is a, seems to be a prime target for, for a, a manned landing in sort of 50 or so years' time. Because the possibility is that there could be some very rich mineral sources on some of these moons or asteroids. So we might be able to see that. But it's, I don't think it's very likely that you're going to get a manned flight to Uranus um, and highly unlikely that, uh, well, very unlikely, possibly, in fact, that anybody will be able to live on the, on the satellite because it's, it's just a ball of liquid. Simon, there's a very comprehensive answer for you there. <laughs> Thank you very much for calling. Sarah, we have hello, yes. Did you say happy birthday to my brother Lee? Oh, happy birthday, Lee. <laughs> happy, birthday. happy birthday. You've got Lee. a birthday as well today. Bye. Great. Bye bye. bye. Now we've got James on line three. Hello, hello James. Hello, James. Um, 
How long do you think it would be before um, real, um, only people have trips to the moon? To the moon? Good question. Well, I don't think that's going to happen for a, a long time. There might be some, some more scientific landings on the moon by astronauts or and cosmonauts, for that matter, after the year 2000, but it's highly unlikely to happen before then. But what is more likely to happen is more and more ordinary citizens, if you like. I mean, I don't really like the term ordinary because we're not exactly ordinary, all of us. But uh, the general citizen will be able to fly into space on the space shuttle. It's going to go up a lot more regularly. It's going to go up possibly 15 times this year, maybe 24 times before 1988. And it's going to carry a lot uh, far range, a wide range, uh, range of uh, passengers, not just scientists, but you know, there's a US teacher going up tomorrow, there's a US journalist going up, and you might even be a British journalist one day. That'd be very nice. Would you like to go in the shuttle, James? Yes. How old are you now? Eleven. Well, there's every possibility then, isn't there? Indeed. What, you know, one of the best routes would be to go to university and get a, a degree in science, I would imagine. Because um, there are lots of opportunities, there are going to be lots of opportunities, so certainly when the uh, US space station is in orbit in the mid-1990s, and that will have British participation. Yes, on all sorts of science, I mean, anything from geology to, to physics Absolutely. to... to Weathermen, yes. communications experts, yes. all So sorts good of luck with that, James. Thank you very much. Mm. That's our course okay, for, for Tim from this morning. Now, what about your bargain, Right, Tim? I've got a bargain here. Uh, this is from fellow space author Matt Irvin. Very nice book called The Cosmos, The Science of the Cosmos. I'll try and be more careful with this book, Matt, than I was with your model. It's, it's all right, it's all in one piece again now. <laughs> and I've got a calendar from Russia, from Intersputnik, which is the commercial communications uh, organisation in Russia called Gosh, Intersputnik. This and must be one of the only ones pictures, in this country. Lovely pictures of Russia. And there's all the Russian words and names and you can learn how to write the word February in Russian and all sorts of things like that. And Lovely. finally there's my book Guinness Space Flight the Records which is a log of all the manned space flights and, and this is statistics. a fascinating book. I've had a good look through this. Lovely. So what is your bargain question? The bargain question is who were the first pilots of the space shuttle? The, the flight of the space shuttle that went into Earth orbit not the atmospheric test. Who were the first pilots to fly the space shuttle? If you know that Please put your answer on a postcard and send it to Saturday Supersaw, BBC TV, London, W12, 8QT. Thank you very much hey, for Sarah. coming in this morning, Tim. There's been so much to talk about and so that little has. time, as always. But would you be so kind as to come on the pop panel a bit later yes, on? Yes, love to. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And now it's time to go and find out what Keith and Leo are doing.